Welcome to Digital Asset News, taking top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets, and breaking them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got some very odd stories. First up, Bitcoin price dropped below 9,000 mid heavy stock market future losses. And what's really going on here is correlation between our market and the traditional markets. Also, building on our last story, we're going to take a look at ways or insidious Wall Street tricks are coming for Bitcoin, says Caitlin Long. And finally, we're going to take a look at a tricky article. The way it was written is very odd, but it talks about Ripple's ODL or on-demand liquidity solution can function without XRP infrastructure. It says the CTO has firm plans to open new ODL corridors. And the way this was written, it makes it sound like you don't need XRP at all. And that's not really what it is. So we'll take a look at all that. Plus, we're going to take a look at a story that was brought to my attention by a subscriber about a podcast host who lost seven years of Bitcoin because of downloading an app from the Google store. I'm going to talk to you about how and why not to do these types of things. So we'll go over all that. But first, let's take a look at the market. So yes, like we just talked about, Bitcoin took a slide, a correction, a dip, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it was down and it was down below 9000 for for a bit. Kind of a scary territory. But here we are. But that is cryptocurrency. You know, it goes up, it goes down. And sometimes it's uh, extremely volatile. But here we are. So looks like 9400 Ethereum holding strong at 230. XRP is XRP, Tether is Tether. Nothing too fantastic except for there's a little project called V Chain all the way down here at 25, and they're up 2.8%. So I don't know exactly what's going on. Someone can let me know what kind of news just happened in the comments section for V Chain to pump a little bit as opposed to everything else. That'd be interesting to find out. All right. Well, actually, I take a look at Zcash and Maker. Maybe it has to do something with that uh, new potential listing on Coinbase. Now, let me know in the comment section. Let's move on to today's first big story. So first up, Bitcoin price drops below 9,000. That's, uh, that's something that uh, I did not see happening this fast. I thought that we would have a, a big correction, but not this quickly. Anyhow. So the article goes on to state that the latest bearish move follows a difficult week for Bitcoin in which markets almost regained 10,000, which was pretty awesome, but just didn't happen before shedding 800 bucks in a matter of hours on Thursday. This was last Thursday. Today, we are looking at uh, Monday, uh, June 15th. So a couple days ago, that is what it was. And then after spending the weekend around 9,400, which is uh, pretty regular, support gave away once more as the outlook for the week on stock markets looked extremely bleak. And this is what I've been preaching. I've been talking about this and it seems like very few people believe me, but uh, the, the traditional markets and the crypto markets are becoming intertwined. And for better or for worse, we're going to have to accept it. Look, I mean, we've got institutional investors coming in all over the place. We did a video yesterday where I talked about, look, you've got uh, Fidelity Digital Assets, Galaxy Digital, and Backed, and they're all going to do uh, custodial services for these big institutional players to come in and what that's going to mean for our market at large. I mean, when we have these big, huge players, I mean, Fidelity has, you know, two to, uh, I think Fidelity Digital Assets has, you know, major amount of uh, uh, assets under management. Fidelity itself has over 7 trillion assets under management. Uh, Backed is a big player. Galaxy is a huge player. So if you have that much money sloshing around, um, there's only one thing that can happen. That is, uh, you know, extreme volatility. And the problem with that, I mean, it's great to have, you know, big money come in, but with big, <laughs> with big money comes big responsibility. And that's exactly what uh, is going on. And we're going to see, we're going to take a look deeper into that in the next story. But you have to understand that uh, this, our market is extremely liquid. People can pull money out 24 seven. Doesn't matter if it's the weekend, if it's night, if it's a holiday, it does not matter. So these traditional players, if they're getting hit, and they know they're going to take a huge hit at some point, and they're like, you know what, I need money, I need to pull out somewhere. Guess where it's going to come from? It's going to come from us. It's going to come from the cryptocurrency and digital asset market. So just get ready. So with you know institutions comes the good and the bad, and that's just the way it is. Anyhow, scrolling down. Nonetheless, hints of correlation remain, with Bitcoin now at its lowest in over two weeks. Last week came a warning that traditional markets were due for a crash-style correction within the next three weeks. So here's my final thoughts. Um, expect a big correction. I think it's going to happen. Um, I, I feel, the way that I see and I look around, I think irrational money. I call it irrational money because it's just people who, they know one thing. They know buy the dip. And... We talked about this yesterday in uh, the video, but there was a story and it talks about uh, the bonkers stock market. And I took a look at Hertz. Hertz is in 
bankruptcy and it dipped so low it, it went from uh, around three or four dollars all the way to like 50 cents 55 cents and people saw that and they said whoa that's a company in distress I'm just gonna buy the dip buy the dip buy the dip and they did and they pumped it all the way back up to five dollars well then the stock exchange said you know what we're gonna delist we're gonna delist Hertz and then with news of that it went down to two dollars so people who are getting in are they just know, I think, just one thing, and they're just dumping money into it, and it's irrational, and it's propping everything up. And, of course, it's also propped up by uh, the Fed, and it's just printing money. So there's no real goods and services being produced. That's the whole point of GDP, uh, but it's just paper money. So I don't see this ending very well. I could be wrong. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section, but um, I'm just going to tell you that I think where the traditional markets goes – is also where the cryptocurrency digital asset market also goes. And uh, I think we're going to see a tighter correlation moving forward. All right, let's move on to the next story. So next up, lots of insidious Wall Street tricks are coming for Bitcoin since Caitlin Long. See, this is my fear, and it may be irrational, but my fears are with the institutional players coming in, uh, they know all the tricks that we don't know. Like we, I personally am not a Wall Street player. <laughs> Obviously, if you listen to my channel, you get that get that feeling pretty quick. Um, so these guys know all all the bells and whistles, all the different tricks, all the scams, all the different things that they can do to manipulate uh, what's going on. And when I see that happening in the cryptocurrency market, it's just even more amplified. We know there was always manipulation, but uh, I feel or I see uh, that's what's going to happen. So this was um, an article. And it was all based on uh, the chief executive of Wyoming-based Avanti Financial Group and 22-year 22 22-year 22 Wall Street veteran Caitlin Long. You know Caitlin Long? She is one of those uh, like top 50 influencers in the cryptocurrency community. I like this lady. I've heard her talk. Uh, the the thing I like about her is that she's already been in the game. She already knows all the tricks. She already knows all the passages. She already knows the shortcuts because she's been in the game of uh, Wall Street. So if she says that insidious Wall Street tricks are maybe on the horizon for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general, you should take note because she knows pretty much what she's talking about. So in a recent episode of Disrupt Meister, I used to listen to him. I haven't heard him in a long time. The former Wyoming Blockchain Task Force Committee member says that while there's nothing inherently wrong with coin lending, she fears that some entities may offer Bitcoin-related products that are not actually backed by Bitcoin itself. And she states, there's absolutely nothing wrong with debt, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with coin lending as long as it's 100% backed with real on-chain coins. And this is the problem with backed, B-A-K-K-T. And again, we talked about this in the story yesterday. Backed down here, uh, they came out with a bang. They were supposed to be awesome. They were going to be uh, custodians for physically backed <laughs> Bitcoin, and they didn't do that. They actually went to uh, cash-based uh, settlements, and that was a big loss. Now they're, you know, uh, reversing their stance. But when you have people who say, "Okay, first we're going to do like, you know, physical Bitcoin. We're going to actually hold Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin." That's great for the market. But if you just have it as some kind of funny money, like, "Ah, we'll just, you know, price it at ninety-seven hundred dollars, and we'll just we'll just settle out in cash," that doesn't help us. That doesn't help us one bit. That's just good for, uh, you know, all the gamblers and the players out there, or traders as they call themselves and uh, I don't care about them I care about this uh, you know our market so uh, when she talks about hey if it's not backed by on-chain coins it's gonna be a problem going on she states when you start to actually have off-chain claims that Bitcoin that are sold as if they are Bitcoin and they are no longer linked to the actual blockchain itself that is where you start to get that circulation credit creeping in. This is the bad type of financialization. And essentially that to me is just gambling. Just like, you know, we're going to leverage trade. We're going to do everything that we have to do. And it doesn't matter about, you know, the physical part. We'll just, eh, whatever it is. She says, I have called it leverage-based financialization. And the way to call it is uncovered claims to Bitcoin that are not 100% backed by real Bitcoin. There are lots of ways that Wall Street does this. It's very insidious. And because of the way the, that accounting works, auditors don't even catch this either. It's something that builds slowly over time. And unfortunately, I think it's probably coming to Bitcoin. So again, when a 22-year veteran of Wall Street says, I know the tricks, I've been there, I play the game, and these things probably are coming in, sit up and take notice. So you know, how do you protect yourself with these types of things? Well, um, you're in the right place at the right time, my friend, uh, because you have the ability to not get into these trusts and these funds and all these uh, uh, different fees and whatnot. You can buy directly. And it's a, it's, 
it's a great thing. Uh, you don't have to go through a middleman. You can go to exchange. You can you can uh, do your own research, and you can figure out how to be your own custodian and keep your own private keys for your product of Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Tomato Coin, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Uh, but you can be your own bank essentially, and that's the beauty of this whole uh, space. Moving on, Caitlin Long points out that entities offering products that involve Bitcoin, such as the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust and LedgerX are not disclosing public keys. She says regulators should step in to avoid any wrongdoing. So Bitcoin Trust, Grayscale, I mean, they're paying a huge premium for Ethereum and Bitcoin for those trusts. I can guarantee that. Uh, we've seen the reports. We've talked about that at nauseum on this channel. Uh, for the LedgerX, <clears throat> We're gonna, I'm going to show you a video that I created that talks about Nano Ledger X, and, and it is and it isn't. And we're going to go over that. Or I'm going to show you how to watch that video later. But to finish up this article, she states, I've been saying this to the regulators. Use the blockchain to your advantage. You can track this stuff and verify that there are no shenanigans happening behind the scenes because gap accounting is not going to pick this up. And that's the beauty, again, of blockchain. You can take a look at behind the curtain and see what the wizard is actually doing. And it's all transparent. And that's one of the reasons why I got into it. So uh, just so you know, for all things related to the Nano Ledger, I created a, a pretty comprehensive video and it goes over over difference between uh, cold wallet, warm wallet, hot wallet, uh, public keys, private keys, uh, seed phrases, and everything else. And it's all right there. I'm going to link this at the very last part in the um, uh, very end of the video, and you can check it out. Also, if you're strapped for time, I even have timestamps. So it'll go over minute by minute about what's going on in different parts of the video. So check that out at the very end. Let's finish up with our last two uh, pieces of articles. Next up, Ripple's on-demand liquidity solution can function without XRP. And this was interesting because when I, when I read that, I had to stop my tracks. I'm like, what? It doesn't make any sense. So here's the article in all its glory. Ripple's on-demand liquidity service, which facilitates international remittances and settlements, can work without leveraging XRP as a bridge currency, according to the chief technical officer of Ripple. So if you don't know, the whole thing with Ripple is cross-border payments. And the problems with the old system is that if you have a bank in the U.S. and you have a bank in Mexico, you have to have uh, money, U.S. dollars, and you also have to have pesos. And you have to have both these banks have both of those things, and they have to pre-fund the, the, these accounts in each bank because banks don't trust each other, which is kind of crazy because I don't trust any bank either. So when they do these things, they're called Nostro Vostro accounts. And what XRP is saying is, look, you don't have to pre-fund it with all these different um monies, different currencies. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to have you pay for XRP as you need it, and you don't have to pre-fund everything. So instead of spending trillions of dollars throughout the globe uh, doing a peso, a euro, a bot, a ruble, a yuan, or whatever else is, uh, else is out there as far as a currency, you can just, as you need it, just pay for uh, what you need to transfer globally, and that's it. And we're only going to char charge you pennies at a time, and that's a pretty good deal. So as, as a business, as a business owner, I mean, I think that's awesome because I am all about liquidity. If I'm a bank and I'm like, okay, I don't have to spend trillions of dollars and pre-fund it and have it just sit there and depreciate, which sucks, and I can go and use that for acquisitions and mergers and different trainings for my people or whatever else I'm going to do with a bank, great, I'm going to do that. So when I, that's the whole beauty of on-demand liquidity in a nutshell. So when I saw this, I'm like, what the heck is going on? So maybe I didn't know what the heck what it was. So moving on in this, in this story, um, the company, Ripple, aims to eliminate the burden of having to hold liquid cash on hand in order for international remittances to work, what we just talked about, pre-funding everything. A Twitter user quizzed Schwartz. Uh, David Schwartz is the chief technical officer of Ripple whether it is possible for the ODL, and I feel like I'm back in the army, all these different acronyms, on-demand liquidity to work without buying or selling XRP. Schwartz responded that the ODL can operate with a piece cut out. This means that one part will be cut out if the person initiating the transaction already has XRP or if the recipient is willing to accept our XRP. So these people have to, in some way, shape, or form, on one side have already owned XRP. Okay, makes sense. So you have one one piece uh, out. May not be as efficient, but uh, whatever. Then the Ripple exec n then notes that the company prefers fiat to fiat transfers 
due to several reasons he didn't mention. I'll get into this in a bit. Furthermore, the ODL can work with no XRP infrastructure at all, which would see it being deployed the fastest. Now, the key word here is deployed the fastest. Not the cheapest, not the most efficient, but it can be deployed the fastest because that's what's going on. All right, and then Schwartz argues that direct payments with XRP require the most infrastructure and will present a major roadblock for institutions uh, as a sender institution would be required to hold XRP while the recipient must be willing to. Okay, this is exhausting. This whole this whole sentence here, this whole thing, uh, it, it says, Schwartz argues that direct payments XRP requires the most infrastructure and would present a major roadblock. That, he didn't say any of that. He didn't say anything about that in this tweet. Now, maybe I'm incorrect, uh, and if somebody knows where he said this somewhere else, let me know in the comment section. Uh, I'm, I could be wrong here, but when I tabbed on or clicked on this to actually look at the actual tweet of what this gentleman said, David Schwartz, when he asked it, or when the question was asked by, by that user, they said, hey, can this be done with an XRP? And, he's, and the first one, he says, we choose to do fiat to fiat first for a few reasons. And what he's talking about here is not we, we want to do this forever, fiat to fiat, but we chose to do fiat to fiat first for a few reasons. And this is he talking about as far as Ripple. Because uh, Ripple is the company, it's just a software company. It's just like Swift. It just uh, is a messaging service for to transfer over. It's not very efficient, but seems to work a little bit better than Swift. Anyhow, so they're going to do fiat to fiat first for a few reasons. Why? Because that's the easiest way to get your foot in the door. Because people don't understand what cryptocurrency, digital assets, blockchain, distributed ledger technology, all those things are. They have to get their foot in the door with something that people understand first. So they're like, hey, do you like Swift? No. Well, I've got another option. It's, we can use Ripple. It's our, you know, Ripple's our company. We have software that can help you. Later on down the road, we can use something else. Anyhow, then he says, but the biggest one is that it can work with no XRP infrastructure at all. Yes, Ripple can work without any XRP infrastructure. So it could be deployed the fastest. Yes, exactly. But they're not going to be doing on-demand liquidity. Then we could then we could use XRP where it could provide the most impact with a ready supply of customers and payments to tap into. So Trojan horse, you get yourself in there, then you say, let's do this. Lastly, he says, ODL can work with a piece cut out. One piece will be cut out if the sender had XRP already. One piece will be cut out if the sender will accept XRP. If both apply, it's just an XRP payment. So that is it in a nutshell. I, th I think there were some liberties uh, taken with this article, which I didn't really understand. So I had to kind of break it down. Now, let me know uh, which parts uh, that I'm incorrect. But what it says to me is, hey, we wanted to start this way. We are in transition and hopefully we can go this on-demand liquidity uh, more so globally to save these banks money. And uh, that's how I see it. All right. Last up. Podcaster lose seven years of Bitcoin. That was a bummer of, a, of an article, but uh, it was sent to me. It was it was sent to me via email by a subscriber. And he asked the question. I said I'm not going to respond to you directly because I need to respond to everybody. So when you send me questions individually, um, if I answered every email that I got as far as a question, I would never have a life. I would never be able to actually do my other businesses. So if you send me a question, uh, I will probably just answer it here or I might even ignore it. So if you have a question, put it in the description because if you have that question, I guarantee hundreds, if not thousands of other people have that same question. So you're doing yourself a disservice if you just send it to me and I just answer you one-on-one. -on -one. That doesn't help anybody. So to answer this question, this person said, hey, I'm really worried about this. What the heck does this mean? So here in a nutshell, ah, this poor gentleman. He, Eric Savix, he lost 113,000 in 20 minutes. It's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty, I mean, sorry, it's not funny. It's pretty fast to lose that much money. I've seen that much money lost when I live in Vegas. Anyhow, uh, entrepreneur and host of the Protocol podcast, Eric Savix, has lost his entire Bitcoin savings, 12 Bitcoin worth $113,000, jeez, in a phishing attack as a result of downloading a malicious version of the Keep Key Bitcoin wallet. I don't know what that is. Apparently, this is it, uh, the next frontier of crypto security, blah, blah, blah. So what did he do? So in a nutshell, I'm not going to read the whole thing. He went to the Google Chrome store, and he looked for an update for the crypto key, whatever this is, uh, hardware wallet, and he downloaded it from the Google Chrome store. And it was a, f <laughs> it was created by a, uh, a hacker, 
and they got and they asked him to enter in his seed phrase which essentially gives you access to the private keys and they took all his money so here's why I created this video right here I created this video to go over every single thing that could potentially happen with warm wallet hot wallet cold wallets like ledger and I guess like whatever the heck this thing is called what is it called uh, keep P. great so first of all I talk about never ever download anything from a third-party website I don't care if it's Google Chrome whatever else go to the official website whatever that is uh, for for this for its ledger.com if you're gonna do a ledger for crypt whatever this thing is called keep key you go to their official website okay second thing is you never give away your seed phrase. And I, I know like some people are screaming at the at the screen right now going, of course, that's so simple, but you don't understand. Everybody is in a different phase of how they enter this market, right? You've got some people who are just entering in and they're like, what's a Bitcoin? Then you have other people on the, on the other end of the spectrum who are like, you know, spouting off technical jargon that even I don't know. So we're all on a spectrum. So just be a little patient. All right. So with this one, I put this together and again, and again, it's all timestamped for you. So you can kind of break everything down. Just watch the whole thing. It's uh, 47 minutes, but it's totally worth it. So you don't lose $113,000. Um, but that's the, that's the big thing. And then this is the latest quote was Jameson Loop, CTO of Casa, which builds security software says, sorry for your loss. Never under a seed phrase. And uh, when in doubt, uh, reach out. And that means that if you are ever like, I don't know if this seems legit, just contact Keep Key, contact Ledger, contact Gemini, contact Uphold, or whatever you're doing with your with your um, um, wallet or your cryptocurrency. Just reach out and say, hey, I don't think this, this looks right. I've done this like two or three times with exchanges, and every single time it was a phishing attack or some type of nonsense where people are trying to take your, your money from you. So uh, just be careful out there, and that's it. All right, so that's it for today's video. I want to say thanks for sticking with me. really appreciate it. Also, I want to say thanks to all my supporters. Uh, if you don't know, there's a join button underneath, and uh, it's just like a tip, essentially. So level ones, they gave a couple bucks, and I just want to say thanks to everybody who gives a couple bucks. It goes to help support the channel and me, so I really appreciate it. Level two, uh, they pay a little more, and I give them a shout-out. So shout-out to All Right Soft. Win Mullet, uh, myself, who else? Dave Plummer, the straight talking guy. He does a, uh, a YouTube channel. Check that out. Grant Sharman. Uh, I've got Bruce Wood, Baking Benjamins. They do uh, baking for Tezos. Noel Flippin Vegas, Martin Lewin, Michael Ralph, William Howell, Crazy Crypto Canuck, Tessie Ryosaki Positive, Fire Swing Golf, JC Durex, Crypto Veritas, John Miller, The Office, El Merg, Michael Jeffrey, The Kell Show, Mage, I think I'm saying that right, Mage or Meg, probably Mage, Research, and then finally we've got Terry Prospery in XRP Carolina, and as a real quick end note, there's a scam alert, my email, dandigitalassetnews at gmail.com, there's an S in the end, uh, there's some person who is uh, sending out an email from dandigitalassetnew at gmail, and they're asking you to uh, sign up for the trading challenge or some nonsense i don't trade i dollar cost average so that's kind of silly so if you get this email from this person uh do two things first of all if you got time uh, email them tell them what a piece of trash he is for trying to steal money from a hard-working person like yourself who you know just goes to work does his or her thing and uh you know makes a honest living and this person's trying to steal money from you it's unacceptable and then second thing uh put that in your spam or junk folder and for your email so it uh, notifies the uh, exchange or the uh, email exchange what's uh what kind of account this is and hopefully they shut it down all right that's it thanks for sticking with me see you on the next one